everyone, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're very happy to wel welcome you all to the launch of Another Art of Poetry in Doorstones by Michael Edwards, um, which is his second collection with Carcanet Press. So my name is Lucy and I work at Carcanet. Um, in just a few minutes, I'll be handing over to our host, Kevin Hart, um, who is gonna be hosting this evening. Um, but I've just got a few housekeeping bits to go over beforehand. So first of all, the event tonight will last for about an hour. Um, there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen, so please do use it. Um, just make sure that you change the settings to make sure it sends to everyone um, so that we all see it. Um, but yeah, please do let us know where you're joining from. Let us know um, what you think of Michael's poems. Uh, there is also a QA and a box. So if you have any questions for Michael during the reading, um, please pop them in there. And then later on in the evening, uh, Kevin can pick a few out to ask Michael. I will be sharing um, the poems on the screen during the reading so that you can read along, but you are in charge of your screen and how it looks. Uh, so do feel free to reconfigure the settings if you like. But if you do have any technical problems at all, just drop them in the chat, let us know, and we'll see what we can do to help. Um, I think the last thing is just thank you for paying your two pounds to be here this evening. Uh, it's redeemable against the cost of the book. I've shared the code in the chat, um, but I will share it again later on in the evening. Uh, so if you miss it, don't worry. We'll also be sending an email tomorrow um, with the with the code on. Um, so yeah, don't worry if you miss it. Okay, so I think that is everything now. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our host, Kevin Hart. So Kevin is the, a professor of theology at the University of Virginia. He's the author of 11 volumes of poetry, most recently Wild Trek, New and Selected Poems and Barefoot. A memoir of his childhood in London and three new collections of poems are incoming. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Michael Edwards today, especially by way of celebrating the appearance of his new book, his new double book, in fact, Another Art of Poetry and Doorstones. Michael's well known to readers of British poetry and also to readers of French poetry, and it's worthwhile to think about what this means for him and for his poetry. Michael was born in southwest London, went to school at Kingston Grammar, and read French and Spanish at Cambridge. He stayed at Cambridge for graduate work on 17th century French drama, although he did much of his research in Paris. The lure of concrete life in France exceeded the demands of scholarship and the prestige of Cambridge, or so perhaps the faculty at Cambridge might have thought. On graduating, he taught at the then new universities of Essex and Warwick, and applied himself to writing on literature at large. He's never been one to confine himself to one narrow field, not even English literature or French literature. The merest glance at his list of publications will show that he's been as interested in Racine as in Shakespeare, as well as in different sorts of modern writers, T.S. Eliot and Samuel Beckett, for example. An attentive reader will notice that both Eliot and Beckett became who they were partly through deep immersion in French. In 2002, Michael was plucked from the land of his birth and appointed to a chair at the Collège de France. It was the chair of creation in English. Once again, we see Michael remaining solidly English while also being honored in France. The very word honored would quickly trigger a long list of institutional honors that have quite properly been given to Michael. I'll refrain from talking about them all, since if I did, I wouldn't have time to say anything else. Suffice it to say that he was elected to the Académie Française in 2013, the first Briton to become an immortal, and knighted in 2014. Michael becomes comes into sharp focus for us uh, with two lenses. One of them we've already seen, England and France, or perhaps better, English and French. The other one is perhaps more familiar, poetry and criticism. But I think it would be a mistake to think of Michael simply as a literary critic. He offers himself as a critic of the visual arts as well as literature, in English and French. And also, most interestingly, 
he presents himself as a commentator on Christianity, including modern Christian culture. As in everything he writes, Michael writes in an inward manner about his subject. His commentaries on poetry scarcely disguise his own experience in the art. His writings on the theater reveal someone who knows dramatic speech from within. His discussions of the visual arts show a man who not only views works of art, but also loves them deeply. And of course, he writes about Christianity from within as an orthodox believer. None of these things is isolated from the other. When Michael writes about Jesus, he does so with a poet's eye to the composition of the Lord's Prayer. And with the view of someone deeply interested in drama when he writes about how Jesus conducts a conversation. And when he writes about literature, he does so with a strong awareness of the large rhythms of biblical poetics. There is, I think anyone would quickly see, a freshness to his commentary, one that's all the more valuable because it makes no sacrifice of rigor and no lack of attention to detail. But if there is a single center to Michael's thinking and his writing, it is surely poetry. His most recent collections with Karkanet are at the Brasserie Lip in 2019 and the double volume that is being launched this evening, another art of poetry in Dorstam. I would very much have liked to quote from Edward Brasserie Lip, which I think is one of the most engaging books of poetry to have come out in Britain in some years, but I cannot for one very simple reason. It is never on my shelves. It's always being borrowed by friends who visit, see it near the dining room table, read a few lines from it, and then borrow it with or without permission for extended periods. It's worth noting that for all his time spent in Paris and Burgundy, for all the ease of his fluency mediating British and French cultures, for all his careful knowledge of the French language, Michael remains very English. We're all familiar with poets and scholars who entranced by French culture, forget the demands and freedoms of English verse and English prose. But Michael is not one of these. His poetry shows that it's possible to learn from the literatures of other cultures without writing anything hybrid. There is little or nothing that is Frenchified in his English poetry, although his poetry composed in French is very French. We might say that he has binocular vision in two languages, two cultures. But in saying so, we mustn't forget that his intellectual and affective roots stretch to other Romance languages and all the way down to the classical languages. Perhaps we shouldn't lean too heavily on the ocular metaphor I've just used, namely binocular vision, since my sense is that his gift for language, and indeed poetic language above all, comes chiefly from an abiding love of music. Michael's poetry keeps alive keeps buoyant the music of English. And it's now, I think, that Michael is going to read to us. I don't wish to say anything about the poems before reading them. I'd rather you heard them first. I can say something about them in conversation with Kevin afterwards, whom, incidentally, I should like to thank very warmly for that introduction. You'll see on the screen that um, the poems I'm reading are accompanied by others on the, poem, on the pages uh, on which they occur. Uh, you'll need to look if you're reading uh, uh, at the same time as you're listening, you'll need to see exactly which poem I'm reading. I begin with number two of another art of poetry. Each has his Eden, remote at hand, haunting the mind whenever it will, a place, a moment, and always, always hard to bear. A path remembered in Wivenhoe Wood containing summer, 
a drawing in a strange way, audible silence of not quite earthly joy. One needed only to look, to walk a few paces, each one his own, unsearchable, or each Christmas, the towering tree, a world from nowhere, mysterious, not for the lights and tinsel, but for its dark presence, the green and receding depths to be entered. Tears here too, though, mostly dry. What does it mean? What does it matter to others? We suffer these gentle hints, like glimpsing far off the tree of life and smelling the unknown, overwhelming resin. And words help evoke each time more exactly or less, and poetry serves meekly to listen and to wonder why. Number 31. A hefty gale, as if the wind had put back a good guzzle of whiskey and reeling and belching and breathing stertorously, roared down the defenceless canyons of the town. The streets are silent otherwise, the walkers absorbed by solid shops and doorways, a few cars like hesitant beetles seeking safety in a hull, in the startled trees, shadows like small animals scuttle among the leaves and the poet gasps for air of his own, though traveling merrily. Oh, for a table in a cool cafe, Hemingway at the next, looking at the girl, looking for the truest sentence he knows. And oh, for the mercy of scattered gales. 52. I fancy the muse is a she. She has no sense of time, doesn't respect the work ethic, drops the most improbable remarks, is impossible to get away from, and easy and dangerous to adore. It's also a ticklish business finding suitable replies, I may add, and you never know what she'll say next. Plus, she turns up at the oddest moments, and rarely. A few of the more epigrammatic uh, numbers, 24. Right at the extreme of love, of language, you'll discover the serpent in the mouth working furiously. 35. Watching buzzards laser the ragged pasture and chase Olympian circles on the air. One sees only extended wings and sky while they, making carefully their way, find one by one the currents and rising, turn their graceful lines, intent as they go on feeling the wind. 48. Prose is Aristotle, master of those who know. Poetry is Socrates, brother 
of those who don't. 75. The great poems of heaven and hell have been written. Those of the new heaven and the new earth, like them, are waiting. 124. Eloquence, one, two, four. Eloquence is like humility. It's there when the act is pure. Back to longer poems, 86. The dark stormlight cast by the eclipse blackens ground ivy and clover, fills the thickets with another world and sinks unknown hues in the silent stream and must be changing cities to unreal or more than real pictures of cities dead or about to rise from the dead as the earthwide cloud slowly vanishes and the sun comes out new like a bridegroom from his chamber. Poetry sheds at its best the same strange light as the world by imitation. One three nine. Like the kingdom of heaven, which is like, poetry is like and unlike, said the cat delicately walking the tightrope. What is poetry? Poetry is like meeting another room through an angled mirror, like moving in the brightness and pace of argument, in rhythmic and sensuous thoughts, like following a street and the whole city unfolds around one, like voicing a language more alive than oneself, like opening prison doors at last. Anything it names is no longer itself, nor yet its further self, like the bird in a shadowed bush, like a bird deep in a poem, like and unlike the same and unknown bird soaring over another recognisable earth. Everything veiled and half revealed. The poet as a high wire vibrating under an aloof and fastidiously stepping feline. One three three. T.S. Eliot said to me once, would you care to remove your chair? It's on my foot. One three, one three eight. Go little book, more durable than ice cream. No shivering midsummer wind on the Folkestone shingle can bowl you over. My brows will be crowned with the knotted handkerchief as long as there is uproar in the House of Commons and Hausats bring down rain. And now some poems from Doorstones. The title Doorstones being uh, more overtly Anglo-Saxon way of saying thresholds. A boy ran hurtling through the southern lane, thick with the smell of privet 
and of plum, free as a hawk, and stopped, held by a light, astonishing the air. What did he think, standing there, open-mouthed? What could he see, his mind so little filled or apt for vision, as, gazing trembling alive at hedges, trees, a pathway, and a sky withdrawn and waiting, being more real in their otherness, he wondered where he was. Am I that boy? Now, as I watch the traffic crawl and hoot in a Paris street, fumbling for voice as ever after the event when heaven meets the eye, I send him words to make good sense of what is in excess of sense. I know the new land to await is gift and promise, and that we and the world have much unfinished business. But that young pup, staring, catching his breath, was maybe closer to the future earth a simple creature touched by immortal wonder. We must prepare to meet with Caliban. The play dissolves, those words stalk in the mind. This thing of darkness, Caliban in me. All mirrors suddenly a fairground farce. Out of his nature plots my double death. Each man an island with a raging brute. What is he saying? Springs, sounds and sweet airs and clouds that open to another sky. This demi-devil with his ugly mug speaks wonders of the world. Dumb once, he now knows how to curse, yet through his twisting lips, he names quick freshes, filberts, scammels, jays, blesses the creatures that he lives among and sees beyond, misjudging Prospero, sees none of this. Poetry knows its way, noses its way to unfinished Caliban, beating him down and listening carefully. The rain relaxes in the cool cafe, island of quiet from the seething street, after contention of the mind before an exhibition's transubstantial walls. Clinking of coffee cups, eddies of talk, and smiles exchanged as we observe the wings five friends of casual subjects as they rise. Marshalling logic to demolish once for all the ties that bind the world, the self, and lost in deepest darkness, David Hume was met by nature as in elder poems who eased delirium, dismissed chimeras. He dined, conversed, made merry with his friends. The wakefulness of reason as the sleep 
produces monsters. Healthiness of soul, salvation, waits in moments, I dare say, prosaic, like the glances each to each, our humour and our confidences cause. The ballet of the hands, and now the sun that has us blink and laugh. The prose of life is where transcendence is, once welcomed. Hume did not pursue this. Backgammon and grace, mostly the ordinary, is the edge. Himmlische Ruhe. Silent mandarin ducks on the lake and gliding widgeon play their part in the water's almost pictured peace. Green of the trees and islands, blue of the sky, inverted, hardly stirring. Here you found mother each time you'd sit with me and watch in Q's familiar gardens, time stands still. That other world you knew had to be there. This calming and awaking of the soul, wherever waters sleep or quietly live, is usual. Everyone, it seems, has known this common place. Rest is a foreign country with infinite and open borders just within or out of reach. A secret kingdom continually appearing near yet far, like sleep or death. You knew this without knowing. Be resting in the only peace there is. And the last poem. Beethoven's late outlandish unheard sounds a Steinway in a spacecraft floating free. Sonorities that stretch the keyboard well beyond its growling and its icy wastes. When Saul fell back into the fallen self, mugged by a devil in the guise of gloom, the cunning harp of David broke the spell and Saul, by listening, was refreshed and well. Beethoven listens to the silent keys, speaking a language that he hardly knows. A world in waiting beckons and withdraws, uncanny mathematics found the way. The music, angel body that evokes, evolves in lucid raptness, would give ears to stones, gives tears to me, a glimpse of heaven here, of what's to come that wanting cannot bring. Those strains, immaculately real, that weird, Beauty, this joy, this gladness, undeserved, alas, convict of sinfulness, of what, in scalding tears, this Easter day, I am. The room reverberates with hammered sound. Another world where one is lost and found.
Well, thank you, Michael. That was quite a treat. Um, why don't we start by thinking about the first volume, first book in, in, the, in the double collection, Another Art of Poetry. And why don't we start by thinking about the title that you've chosen for it. Um, it seems to me that it goes in two directions that could be usefully followed. In one sense, it's one more Ars Poetica. Uh, the Ars Poetica tradition, as, as you know, goes back at least as far as Horace, and there are many distinguished contributions all the way through. But it looks to me also that you're inviting the reader to imagine a different sort of Ars Poetica, another Ars Poetica, one which is other than those which we're familiar with. One which is perhaps, as I read the book, um, non-dogmatic in what it says about poetry. It's not prescriptive. You're not trying to impose your particular vision of writing poetry on others. Um, one that can be humorous, which we don't find much of in Horace, I think. One which can encompass the aphorism as well as the lyric, and maybe other things as well. Um, is there anything in all of that, do you think? I think you're absolutely right, Kevin. I would have begun where you did. Uh, the book's title is, in a sense, modest. It's just another after Pope, Sydney, etc. Voilà, uh, on the other hand, it's not really modest at all. Um, and I think it's another, uh, firstly, in the sense that uh, a, a properly organized um, Ars Poetica ought to have a continuous argument, or at least a thinking that works forward. Um, whereas uh, my Another Art of Poetry, has, as you say, a number of epigrammatic poems, which are clearly and obviously about poetry. But I also wanted to open up the idea of a uh, poetic art to what actually happens when you write poetry, because so many of the poems that one writes have uh, as one of their meanings, um, a, a light shining on poetry itself. So the book in, uh, involves all sorts of poems uh, concerning things that have happened to me, the circumstances in which I find myself, um, the uh, old themes that are well um, uh, written about, but which still need to be written about, the old conventional things like love and death and life and God and heaven and anxiety and self-abasement and humility and so on. Uh, so that, that many of the poems are, at first sight, simply poems. It's then you realise that they're also um, being guided towards um, what poetry, as it were, is, what it's there for, what it's doing. Uh, and also, as I, I think you began to say, it's a book in which I tried to, well, I didn't try to, it, it came naturally. Um, the tones of voice are continually changing. There's humour, there's irony, there's sarcasm, um, there's um, self-abhorrence. Uh, and uh, this seems to me also uh, important, one, as saying something about poetry, which is that poetry can encompass anything and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, something important about ourselves, the self of the poet is itself heterogeneous. There isn't a one Michael Edwards um, who writes. Uh, and by continually changing the tone, one gets this sense, it seems to me, both of the inventiveness of poetry and its, its um, omnipresence, in a sense, and also the fact that the person writing um, is so complex that most of the time he doesn't know what he's going to say until he says it. I could go on, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Let me just uh, slightly redirect you. Um, if we look at section 51 of this long poem, um, poetry is concrete, reinforced by thought, that gives in the wind and remains standing. Now, this is a very interesting uh, little group of four lines. When you say that poetry is concrete, in what, that one line before we get to the next line, 
you're saying, tell me if this is true, that it's specific. Um, it's, you're pointing to things which are unique. But also, as we go on to the word reinforced, we think of reinforced concrete and we think of an aggregate, a, a, a building. But it's a building which gives in the wind. It, it moves. It allows some movement, but nonetheless remains. Now, this is a, a very nice little image, it seems to me, of the whole, and in many ways of all of your poetry. Does, does that seem about right? Yes, yes. Um, uh, I'm always interested in the metaphysical poets, uh, the way in which they make horrible jokes like concrete reinforced mm -hmm. uh, rather than reinforced concrete, and by the way in which there's humour when they're being extremely serious. And I don't in any sense imitate Dunn, Marvell and so on. It, this is the way I write. This is the way I am, I think. And it's also a way of being very serious while not taking myself seriously. Hence that poem about T.S. Eliot. Hence the poem, Go Little Book, which takes up the ending of, of Goddess and Cresset, of, of, of Chaucer and so on. Um, by concrete, I also meant, in fact, I think I meant specifically that poetry is actually about um, the realities of the world. It doesn't exist in a kind of um, cerebral world of thought and idea. It is actually about uh, the prosaic things that I mentioned, I think, in the last poem, or one of the mm. last poems. Um, uh, and it's concrete in the sense that it is always about something specific, as you say, um, reinforced by thought, because if we just described a, a red wheelbarrow, we would simply be describing a red wheelbarrow. But when Williams does so, there is a thought which sees what a glazed, a glaze on the red wheelbarrow could, could mean beyond itself. There's a mm -hmm. sort of, you wouldn't like the word possibly, but there's a sort of transcendence. Um, and that gives in the wind, well, wind, of course, is a metaphor that I'm continually using, as with the buzzards, that, that are able to rise and, and um, write to their lines. I'm obviously thinking of poets writing their lines. They're able to rise because they can feel the wind and they feel for the wind. And the wind, obviously, is in so many languages, also spirit uh, and breath. Um, and I, I imagine the buzzards as as poets waiting for that impus, impetus, that inspiration, not inspiration from God, but well, who knows? But that that inspiration, which which comes, as we know, in certain moments where we write something quite good and think afterwards that's rather good. But I wish I'd written it you know? <laughs> um, and remain standing because. Uh, even a little poem like The Red Wheelbarrow might think it suddenly came to my mind, um, of Williams, still stands, it's there. You can go back to it time and again. Um, yeah, it's, um, you, you also talk in a similar way about poetry being a marriage, if I remember correctly, of magic and police report. And the word magic is not one which is new to you. You've written a, a very fine book about the magic of resemblance uh, with regard to the visual arts. Um, and it seems to me that what you're trying to suggest with a little dash of humor is not only is poetry magic, which lots of people have said, but what they haven't said is that it has the kind of brusqueness and exactness of a police report trying to identify someone or something and perhaps to arrest it as well, to, to hold it still so it can be examined and indeed brought up for question if need be. Yes, I think you've put it very well. Um, uh, and I think also the, uh, uh, well, to begin with the magic, it's a word that I, I'm slightly suspicious of, obviously. Um, but it does seem to me that there is something magic about language to start with. Um, merely naming something adds something, adds to what we are naming. And when language then becomes poetry, as we know, poetry in naming renames. And there is a sort of 
magic effect of words in poetry on the things that they name. Mm. Um, and uh, it's as to the police report, I was thinking of that and also of the fact that poetry cannot simply be wonder in front of the world, wonder in front of what poetry itself can perform. Uh, it has to take account of the fact that we are wretched. Mm. Um, the police report is on us. Uh, the police report says um, that we are criminals. Um, this is my Christianity obviously coming through in a way that I hope isn't, uh, isn't too overwhelming. Uh, the police report is is what a, what good poetry I think makes one sense um, that one is one sense one is oneself guilty and that poetry can combine this sort of magic opening of the world to otherness with the sense of um, the guilt that we are um, the the wretched condition in which we find ourselves as well as all the joy and so on um, and all this is part of a larger movement which is I think also in to come back to your very first question in another art of poetry because what I'm suggesting in another art of poetry is that um, I have to simplify it because we don't have the hours on end that you and I have together when we meet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, poetry is, for me, a way of naming the world in such a way that one senses the loss of Eden and one gets a glimpse of the new earth. The idea of the new earth in the Bible struck me very early on and seemed to be extraordinarily important. Um, that here is a religion that says not there's another world that you, you can go to or um, there's a nothing that you can go to but that the earth will be renewed um, and poetry by renewing our perception of the world doesn't of course renew it but it does give us glimpse of that renewal as it gives us glimpse it seems to me of the world that everyone seems to know we've lost. I mean, the Greeks talked about the golden age. Well, they, they didn't have the Bible to tell them about Eden. Um, we all know that there's something we've lost. Wordsworth thinks it's childhood, so did, so did Vaughan. Um, then probably not entirely wrong, except that children are evil, just as at least I was, uh, as much as adults. I went on a bit there, uh, Kevin, but... Well, that, uh, that was really great. And in fact, it leads me to, <laughs> to another question that I had. Um, one of the things I wanted to do when we were talking is alert people to the intellectual texture of what might seem to be even very tiny, fleck-like poems, like number 180. A poem is the hope of poetry become hope. Now, you'll tell me if this is wrong. But when I read that, how many lines, how many words is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine words. It seems to me that you might be alluding to a French poet, something you don't tend to do that often, René Char, where Char speaks about the poem being the love of desire that has remained desire. A sentence of Shah's I've always liked because it gives that sense that poetry, no matter how old it all is, always has that sense of aching and desiring. It's never fully resolved. All the best poems are still thinking and still desiring. But I thought it was really intriguing that you don't go in the direction of desire, which would be very French, but you go in the direction of hope. And that's certainly something which has got religious significance for you. So there's not only the aesthetic hope that the poem will become a poem, the poem which is being written will become a poem, but also that the poem must embody and to some extent realize hope. My commentary yes. already yes. many times longer than your poem, you see. <laughs> yes, I wasn't at all thinking about Charles. Um, <laughs> well, I very often quote him. Um, but yes, I see your point. I see the, I understand the comparison. A poem is the hope of poetry become hope. Uh, it, is, it is a religious um, 
poem, if you can call it a poem, two lines. Um, it has got a lot of thought in it. It's got a, a thought of a lifetime in a sense. Um, that poetry by um, always giving us a sense of beauty um, and a kind of joy in its, in its form, even when what uh, the poet is talking about is awful. I mean, think of Greek tragedy, you know, no mm -hmm. one goes to a Greek tragedy to feel awful. You come away feeling elated. Um, uh, poetry by always giving you beauty, um, uh, joy, uh, the pleasure simply of language going beyond itself is, it, is for me um, a, a hope that the world itself and oneself, oneself, uh, would be um, recreated, would become new. Uh, and it's the hope, therefore, that poetry that one writes will, will embody that sort of hope and that for the reader too, it will become hope. I'm much amazed and more and more amazed as I grow, not older, but less young, um, by the fact that um, all art is joyful. No one reads the Lamentations of Jeremiah to feel sad. Of course, you do get this sense of terrible loss and sadness, but you get it in a poem which is fabulously well written, fabulously complex, um, alphabetical, in fact. Um, and what you get from it ultimately is joy. And in Talis's version, two versions of, of Jeremiah's Lamentations, what you get as you listen to the music, of course, is, is a kind of euphoria, a euphoria which accompanies the, the gloom uh, and the, the loss felt by the Catholics in, in 16th century England, which is after all what Talis is meaning by um, the Babylonian captivity. Um, well, there we are. Yes. There we are. Now, before I pose the last question, let me just remind people in the audience that you have an opportunity to pose questions to Michael. And after this last question, I'm going to go to the Q&A, which at the moment I think has just got one question. And, and I'll phrase one or two questions from that. But the last question I want to ask turns on the line that you read earlier mostly the ordinary is the edge and this is a theme that runs throughout your poetry i think namely that the ordinary is pleated with the extraordinary the everyday with the biblical and in your poems in in Dorstern's, we find not only everyday events in your life in paris and burgundy references to poets, including, if I remember correctly, René Char at one stage, meet, meeting, meeting Paul, your son. Yes. Um, uh, but also biblical characters, David, Saul, St. Paul, Christ, Judas, and then other people in the Christian tradition, Tyndale, great um, writers like David Hume come in and Beethoven. Now, the edge, I take it, the edge is the place where things become a bit edgy, where the ordinary breaks down, where, where there's a possibility of lift off or indeed complete, complete failure if you jump off the edge precipitously. But I take it you mean that um, the ordinary is in the edge, that it actually is contained in the edge. Would that be so? I wouldn't have put it like that, but yes, I think so. Um, what amazes me about um, my, from my experience, in my experience, is that so often those moments when I sense that um, there is something transcendent, there is another world which is not elsewhere, it's, it's in a sense here, all around us. Those moments usually occur um, uh, in very simple circumstances. Uh, and or in connection with very simple objects, uh, a glass of water, for instance, or a tree or a, an old wall. Mm. Um, and I'm much struck too by the fact that this seems to be um, 
a Hebraic way of thinking. I'm no expert, obviously, in, in the Hebraic way of seeing the world, but from reading the Bible, Old and New Testament, uh, so often um, what is really um, evidently transcendental, more transcendental than anything I can achieve, um, is grounded in the most simple circumstances. Um, when uh, God appears to, Mam uh, to um, Abram, for instance, <clears throat> in the absolutely crucial moment with the definition of faith, he does so, um, I think there are two translations possible, among the trees of Mamre. Uh, <clears throat> why are we told that it's there? Um, and so often, um, uh, Jesus himself uses the sort of um, similes, comparisons, and so on, metaphors that show that he too, if one can put it, like, no, not he too, I mean, it's, he's never an also, that he um, sees the, um, the transcendent in very, very simple things. Uh, and it seems to me that one needs to write a poetry like that to get away from the notion that, well, the Longinus sense that, um, you know, the sublime, it's in great rivers. Well, for me, the sublime is in the little stream that runs down um, through, the, uh, through our orchard, um, which is not very wide at all, about a foot. Um, there are some moments when light in the water and a dragonfly flying over it and so on seem to arrest time. And it's so often those little moments to me when time seems to stop and something else enters and takes me over. Right. Let's, let me just open this um, magic box here called Q&A and see what we have. Um, okay, let me read this question. This comes from another Michael, someone I think you've heard of called Michael Schmidt. Ah. Yeah, um, yes, indeed. you have to give a polite answer to this. There is a we in the poems and a you and I. The we seems to include, as Elegy does, the gone with whom one is most at home. Oh, the, the gone, the person who's left with whom one is most at home. Both books have an elegiac feel. The poems seem to warm, what want to reinvent a no longer common reader. I kept feeling the 18th century where those who choose to go there are most comfortably at home, a very generous imagination. The question is, who is the reader addressed in time, culture, and space? Wow. <laughs> uh, I don't really know where to begin. <laughs> um... I write the poems that come um, and in a sense, I speak them, I don't write them. Um, and I wait until the, the rhythms, the music of English seems to merge with what is being said, with the signified. Um, and which means that since I'm speaking, I do think of the reader. Um, but not in any um, constraining sense. Uh, I mean, if the question, which includes about 20 questions, as far as I can see, is partly what about the reader in all this, um, then I have to say that I am always speaking to the reader, um, but that I am uh, hoping the reader will um make the effort as it were if effort is needed to see further into the poem uh, most poem most of the great poems that i read actually uh, great poets write that sort of poetry um, even the poets who write poems which seem to be um let's say user friendly <coughs> um, and simple um, have have ideas in their poems or reaches in their poems, which you have to look for after much reading. Um, that's one response. Now, the, the, the question was so complex, I can't even remember all the other 
things that come well, in. What about the idea that Michael proposes that there's something of the 18th century? Well, necessarily, it's not heroic couplets or anything like that, obviously, but some kind of ambiance of the 18th century in the in your poetics. Well, I'm much interested in the 18th century, and I, I have defended passionately the poetry of Pope, mm. um, which seems to me uh, extraordinarily moving, uh, metaphoric, and about the real world, not at all um, as one sometimes uh, presents him. Um, but I, um, I suppose it's Augustine in the sense that I'd like to think that it's quite intelligent, and the Augustans are all very intelligent poets. Um, but I think it, I think the pace is different from, I'm thinking aloud here actually, because mm -hmm. I haven't thought of this before, but I think the pace is different and the, um, the wit, if one could call it that, is different too. Um, the, the wit, I think, is far more, as I said earlier, um, metaphysical. Um, and the changes not only of tone, obviously Dryden and Pope changed tone and so on, and um, Johnson, not only the changes of tone, but the changes of um, subject matter within the poem uh, are quite different, it seems to me, from... Um, I think Michael is also paying you a compliment that he talks about the generosity that the 18th century has. Um, that was a word I missed, sorry. That, that Michael might be paying you a compliment. Yes. He talks about the generosity of your imagination, where people feel at home in the way that certain 18th century poets also make the reader feel very much at home. And for all of their brilliance and wonder, one wouldn't think immediately of, say, T.S. Eliot or Geoffrey Hill or Yeats making one feel immediately at home. So there seems to be something I think Mike was suggesting about the amenability of your poetry. Ah. Well, I must admit I hadn't picked that up um, because it came in a little bit late, I think. Right. Um, I hope it's amenable. Um, there are lots of illusions, of course. Um, and not everyone is going to pick them all up, but it doesn't matter. Um, and when I quote, I do um, have notes at the back of the book saying what it is that I'm quoting. Uh, but it's true that... Um, I'd like to think that the, the reader is in the room with me and that as I'm making strenuous efforts to make a poem, which very often is very complex, uh, that the reader will sort of smilingly think, well, okay, um, if I like it enough, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read it several times. Right, yes, Th thank you, thank you very much. And let me hand back now to um, our hosts in Manchester. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael, for reading for us this evening. Um, really, really enjoyed listening to you read. And thank you, Kevin, for being such a great host. Um, yeah, it's just been a really great evening. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, the discount code is in the chat um, so that you can get your own copy. Um, but we'll, like I said earlier, we'll be following up in an email as well. Um, I also just wanted to mention that the next Carcanet launch is next Wednesday. It's the launch of Before We Go Any Further by Tristan and Fame Saunders. So I'll just pop that in the chat now as well. So I'm just going to keep the event open for another minute so that you can get those details and get those discount codes. Um, but yeah, thank you again, uh, Michael and Kevin, and hope to see you all again soon.